Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture for March 30th, which is going to be a very interesting application of technologies in proteomics and other parts of analytical chemistry to fascinating issues that relate to identification of biomarkers that may be predictive of translational success, something that we're all interested in. And certainly here at NIH, with the increased conversation we're having about how to play as effective a role as possible in helping projects get across the valley of death uh, from an original good idea to something that you can actually put into a human patient with some confidence it might work. Uh, the technology you're going to be hearing about today from Steve Carr is highly relevant. I'm not sure whether when Steve got his PhD in analytical chemistry at MIT about 30 years ago, he would have imagined coming to the NIH uh, to give a special lecture of this sort. I would bet maybe that wasn't quite part of the life plan, but it is a great example of the way in which disciplines that maybe in the past didn't intersect all that much are now intersecting a lot uh, in the service of medical research. And uh, it's great to see those boundaries breaking down. And oftentimes, some of the most interesting science uh, seems to happen at those interfaces. Steve has been working at those interfaces uh, throughout a very interesting career. After that PhD from MIT and a postdoc also at MIT, uh, he went on uh, to be for three years at Harvard Medical School and then moved over to the private sector and spent many years at SmithKline, which then became SmithKline Beecham, which then became GlaxoSmithKline. As you know, these things tend to have their evolutionary process. Uh, and then ultimately uh, made a leap about 10 years ago into a new uh, company called Millennium, familiar to many of you, which uh, no doubt was a wild ride in the early days of that enterprise. Uh, then after a year at Northeastern at the Barnett Institute, uh, he joined uh, the Broad Institute, which was just getting underway at that point, an institute that many of us are very familiar with as just a remarkable uh, engine of discovery in Boston uh, that brings together lots of exciting ideas and investigators and technologies. And there, Steve serves as the platform director uh, for proteomics and biomarker discovery, overseeing a team of about 20 individuals who are involved in a wide range of interesting projects that cross many different diseases. And uh, certainly, I'm sure if he wanted to talk about all of those, we'd be here uh, for many hours. But he's going to talk about quantitative biology and biomarker discovery without immunoassays, making it clear that well, you don't have to have an antibody to be able to measure a protein. And that's a good thing, because we all know we don't have enough antibodies, or at least not enough that are all that effective in their specificity and sensitivity. The mass spectrometer uh, comes to the rescue, and Steve has been a leader in figuring out ways how to do that in a highly multiplex, sensitive fashion, in a fashion that also allows you to assess uh, the quantitative levels of lots of proteins in biological fluids derived from uh, real human beings. So we're delighted to have Steve here with us this afternoon. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Steve Carr. Thanks very much to Francis for that terrific introduction. And thanks everyone uh, who's here to hear my lecture this afternoon. That's the title. I'll jump right into this. Um, I think Francis hit it right on the head that we have lots of things that we would like to measure, not enough high quality reagents to be able to make those measurements with. So uh, given the, the focus at my institute and in many places on doing genomic based discoveries, I just want to remind everybody that the, the road, the path to phenotype goes through proteins in a large number, if not in all cases. And so we have large numbers of proteins that we would like to be able to measure the, um, you know, just the unannotated Orpheum, of course, is on the order of 20,000 proteins predicted, and the modification status of these is enormous. 100,000 is a, is a total guess. Uh, but it's a, it's a big number. And we'd like to be able to make these measurements of proteins and their modification states in a variety of diseases, states of development, treatment with drug, uh, and genomic perturbations such as a knockout or a, a knock-in. Uh, where we're at right now are experiments that are yielding large numbers of hypotheses of unclear relevance. And I'll come back onto that point in a moment. So we have this gap. And, you know, this terminology, valley of death, can be applied in a number of contexts, and I would 
um, conjecture or, or uh, s uh, venture to say that this represents a valley of death for, for these measurements where we don't, we have a, an unmet need in order to achieve measurement of all of these relevant changes using assays that are highly specific, sensitive, precise, and importantly can be multiplexed, particularly in the biomarker area. I mean, it is, if you're in a discovery mode, it really isn't practical to be taking 100 microliters of patient plasma and measuring one analyte when you want to march across 100 different proteins. You, you know, you have to bleed people considerably in order to, di to do that. Uh, it's not ethical, it's not practical. Uh, but our goal here is really to get to quantitative biological knowledge. So there's a gap, and that gap has largely been filled uh, now for decades with uh, immunoassays. And these are critically important reagents. They will remain critically important reagents. However, the situation that we find ourselves in now in terms of new proteins that are being identified in our experiments, whether they're coming out of genomic-based identification or from uh, other omics discovery methods like proteomics, is that the number of useful antibodies that we have to measure these molecules with is relatively small versus the large number of candidates that we're faced with. And making new immunoassay-capable antibodies that are really specific and sensitive uh, is, a, is a fairly um, time-consuming and expensive task. So it would be nice if we had new approaches to this problem, and that's where I'll be focusing a lot of my talk today. There have been um, advances made in the application of existing uh, technologies into array formats to increase the multiplexibility and throughput of these approaches, such as the use of antibody arrays. There's been advances made in the aptamer area, particularly through uh, uh, the company Somologic and Larry Gold's efforts, and work in uh, displaying peptides, proteins, and peptoids, which are uh, synthetic analogs of peptides, to look at proteins that are bound. But again, these methodologies really are limited by content. The availability of high-quality reagents to put down on these arrays or aptamers uh, and the lack of demonstrated specificity plague these approaches. So uh, I'm not going to talk today much at all about the discovery arm of the proteomics pipeline, but I want to emphasize that one of the places where this lack of reagents is most acutely felt is in biomarker uh, discovery. And a functioning pipeline for doing this work requires you have to start with some kind of a discovery uh, method. This could be proteomics, and it can be other sources of information, be it the literature or uh, genomic-based uh, methods. But you end up, from your discovery efforts, not with biomarkers, but with candidates that then need to be uh, evaluated in some means. And here in lies the key need. Uh, technologies to bridge this gap from discovery to true clinical validation. And we'll come back on to, we're going to talk about primarily the central aspect, but briefly touch on the former. So discovery. Discovery has uh, gotten a really bad name uh, in proteomics, and in part because uh, of where a lot of this work was started. And trying to do discovery work using plasma or serum if it can be avoided, is a terribly difficult place to start. And that's, and you can just look at the results. Even today, the best efforts to date have yielded fewer than 2,000 proteins confidently identified out of plasma or serum. And this is, uh, the problem here really is the enormous dynamic range of the proteins that are pleasant, present in blood, um, estimated to be on the order of 10 to the 11th. Many of these proteins, or, or a small number, I should say, of these proteins are present in extremely high abundance. Um, and the dynamic range of the mass spectrometer is actually quite limited relative to this dynamic range. So we face a problem here in, in trying to uh, analyze blood. Better starting place are tissues or proximal fluids. A proximal fluid is a surrogate of uh, the, the tissue. Uh, proximal fluids such as um, synovial fluid, or even CSF for brain-derived uh, uh, proteins. Uh, in this case, this proximal fluid is taking a tumor tissue, dicing it up, putting it into phosphate-buffered saline, and then putting it into an incubator to um, be able to 
create a pseudoproximal fluid of the actively shed and secreted proteins. And we're using this process uh, in our biomarker discoveries in a variety of solid tumors. And when you do this, the, it's quite, quite striking the contrast in terms of the depth of coverage that one gets. So rather than 2,000 proteins, you typically get six to 8,000 unique protein groups confidently identified. So you're getting much deeper into these proteomes, possibly as much as 50% of the actively expressed proteins are actually detectable uh, in these samples. And importantly, in the case of our uh, uh, various cancer studies, when we look at the lists, they're highly enriched for proteins which have been previously identified as associated with cancer. Is that proof that this is working? No. But if that weren't the case, I would say full stop. Now, one of the problems with any discovery approach, and we'll come back onto this, this, in order to get to this depth, you have to do a lot of sample processing. And we typically will deplete abundant proteins, extensively fractionate at the peptide and possibly even the protein level, and then lengthy on-instrument analyses. A typical analysis in our lab takes essentially two weeks per sample running 24-7 on the machine. Uh, when you do that, you get to these sorts of numbers, and typically what you'll observe is that 5 to 15 percent of the proteins are five-fold or higher overexpressed in the tumor versus the control. So you're talking about hundreds to upwards to a thousand proteins that are candidates coming out of these experiments. That's the problem. There aren't a thousand antibodies that you can then go to the catalog and use to analyze uh, whether or not these proteins hold up in larger numbers of patient samples. So just to, just to reflect on this for a moment, tell you where we are. Our discovery omics yield minimally credentialed markers or testable hypotheses, not biomarkers. And we get hundreds of these candidates out of these differential expression analysis experiments. Uh, deep interrogation, as I've said, increases the analysis time, which limits the practical number of samples that you can analyze in these discovery experiments. And as we all know, use of few samples in a discovery mode is against very high data dimensionality is the recipe for a high false discovery rate. Now that does not mean, I just want to dwell on this for a moment, it does not mean that the underlying technical reproducibility of the mass spectrometer is faulty. In fact, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, Richard Smith's lab at PNNL and my lab have collaborated to compare what the technical reproducibility is in exactly this highly complex fractionation and analysis paradigm. And what we find is, is that 80% of the proteins that we identify are common between the laboratories across multiple patient samples. And more importantly, 75% of the proteins that are differential, identified as being differentially abundant, fivefold or higher, are also in common. So on a technical basis, these instruments are producing similar results. The problem is that there's great inter-individual variability from patient to patient, and a high protein level in one patient does not mean it's a biomarker. It could just be normal, normal variation in that protein abundance. And, and finally, we, we typically will, we're, we're not, um, you know, uh, so provincial that we only look at our proteomics data. We typically will mine microarray experiments of high quality. Of course, we go to the literature. And so we'll enrich our candidate list with the results from these other omics experiments for which there is no information at all about the presence or detectability of those candidates in peripheral blood, which is ultimately where our biomarker test has to be deployed. So what we need here are robust quantitative methods to help us prioritize these lengthy lists of candidates that are coming out of our discovery experiments to whittle down to a list that's really worth evaluating in large numbers of patient samples. And I'm going to describe to you now our two approaches that we've developed that are, are really kind of interwoven that sequentially step you through prioritization and then quantitative assays for these proteins. Uh, that's this verification arm, and we're going to have an acronym soup here, which I'm not going to dwell on, but I'm going to walk you through each of these technologies in a moment. And immunoassays remain on this list because, you know, we will be opportunistic if good quality reagents are available. So step one of this is use of a semi-quantitative, label-free targeted approach to detect protein candidates in patient plasma. And we call this accurate inclusion mass screening. So what we're doing here is a, a, a very small scale rediscovery experiment. The sample processing of, and now we move from our, wherever we discovered it, 
whether it be tissue, whether it be proximal fluid, we now are going to look in blood and ask and answer the question, wherever we discover this protein, is it in fact detectable in peripheral blood in cases, and is it differentially abundant in, uh, in cases versus controls? Uh, so we deplete abundant proteins, we cut, down, cut the, the proteins up to peptides, and we have a small, relatively small number of fractions that we then interrogate using, a tar using the same instrument we use for discovery, but now using it in a targeted fashion. So these instruments are pretty marvelous these days. You can tell them, I'd like to, you, you can create lists of peptides to go after that are as long as 2,000 peptides in length. So we use our discovery experiment knowing what peptides we observe for our differentially abundant proteins, and we populate our inclusion lists with the masses of these peptides. And then what the instrument does is it looks constantly every few microseconds at that list and asks, am I detecting anything within a few part per million that is, and this is, you know, for, for a peptide of mass 1,000, that's in the fourth decimal place is where we're looking. Uh, for a peptide that has a mass that's within the tolerance on the list, if I see it, then and only then do I trigger collection of the sequencing experiment. That's the MSMS experiment. So in this way, we use the cycle time of the machine only to focus in on things that are on that list and not look at anything else. This is, um, we get better sensitivity, uh, better CVs in this approach. It's highly specific because we're using accurate mass and high resolution selection of the precursors. We can do up to 2,000 peptides monitored in a run. So the way to think about this is like a highly multiplex mass spectrometry western. It's not quantitative, it's semi-quantitative, but it's useful for asking and answering this question. Just to give you a result without walking you through all the data, in the case of the breast cancer biomarker project, where we had more than 6,000 unique proteins identified in tumor interstitial fluid and nipple aspirate fluid, we had 1,200 out of those 6,000 proteins upregulated more than fivefold in the discovery data. We were able to observe 250, or roughly 20% of the 1,200, uh, in, our, uh, in the peripheral plasma of patient cases. So this reduces our list quite significantly, and it's now that 250 that we would focus additional work on. In another study that I'll walk through in a little bit more detail, this is a model of myocardial infarction called the PLAN Myocardial Infarction Model, PMI. Uh, in humans, we identified roughly 1,200 proteins in our discovery experiment. You notice, again, this was done in blood. That's we had to start there. Of those 1,200, roughly 10%, 122, were upregulated fivefold, and 52 of those were qualified in peripheral blood from uh, a different set of patients uh, undergoing this procedure. So again, these now become, in blue, the, the targets for subsequent work. The next step in this process is development of targeted MS-based assays to measure these things uh, in large numbers of patient samples. And here we're going to use something called stable isotope dilution, multiple reaction monitoring, or selective reaction monitoring, LCMS. That's a big mouthful, um, but it really is technology that we didn't invent, but we co-opted from the clinical chemistry community that had been using this probably for 30 years or longer for the analysis of small molecules. We are just using that same general approach now to measure quantitatively proteins based on peptides derived from those proteins in complex biological samples. So the way we do this is here are our candidates. These are the proteins that were differentially abundant or derived from literature. Uh, we define signature peptides. These are peptides that we expect we either observed from these proteins or would expect to observe using computational approaches that we can talk about in Q&A. There's ways of doing this. We synthesize internal standards, which are heavy, stable, has stable isotopically labeled versions of these peptides, and spike them in with our sample and analyze them together with the endogenous or light version of that peptide. Um, these stable peptides that we add are physiochemically identical to the naturally derived peptide. They weigh, the, so, so the only difference is that they weigh more than the peptide that is naturally occurring in, um, in, in the sample. And typically we do this by labeling the uh, C-terminal lysine or arginine with carbon-13 and N-15 
isotopes. But every other property, its retention time, the way it fragments, is identical to the light peptide. And we didn't use, a, this is the MRM technology. Don't worry too much about this. I only want you to uh, understand the following. Samples being sprayed out of the liquid chromatograph. We select specific species in the sample. These are the peptides, the heavy and the light version of the peptide that we want to monitor. We break them apart, and then we analyze only a, uh, a small set of the fragments, not all of the fragments from these peptides. And all of this is done to increase our, our cycle time, our throughput. Uh, and then we ratio in order to get the, uh, uh, the ratio of the analyte peptide to the spiked in peptide. Pretty simple. What's important here is that these ratios give us precise relative quantification. We'll come back to this. This is not accurate quantification. There are ways of getting to that when you need to, but this is just highly precise relative quantification, which is what we need for measuring across patient samples and looking at changes. Importantly, we can do this in a highly multiplexed fashion where we can do tens to, and I'll show you in a moment, 100 or more peptides simultaneously can be quantified. And very importantly, these experiments give us 50 to 100 times more sensitivity than conventional MS-based approaches. Um, this work is now, was published in Nature Biotechnology uh, in 2009, but represented a large scale, really the first large scale inter-laboratory evaluation of this technology. It was driven um, through the NCI CPTAC program, uh, and it demonstrated really for the first time that these methodologies could be multiplexed, assays could be configured and deployed across even non-expert labs with a high reproducibility and uh, uh, both intra and inter-lab CVs of 20% or lower, which seem, you know, might strike you from a clinical perspective, oh, 20%, that's pretty high, but realize these are not clinical assays. They don't need to be clinical assays to satisfy the needs of this verification step. Um, and if we, in Q&A, we can talk, there are ways of getting these CVs down well into the clinical assay sub 10% range when we need to. And importantly, we created reagents and methods and multi-laboratory data sets that are available um, online in public repositories. Uh, and this has facilitated other laboratories getting into this, into this business. I should point out this, the goal of the study was not to achieve high sensitivity. Certainly getting one to three microgram at the protein level per mil is not particularly sensitive. That's the point of subsequent studies. But to that point, oh, and I just should say this is, here is a subsequent study that is uh, uh, underway. Uh, it's looking at 125 plex MRM assay, now done in depleted plasma. So the reason for using depleted plasma is to get the LODs and LOQs down well into the nanogram per mil range, a more reasonable range for a lot of uh, uh, potential biomarkers of interest. Um, we're, yeah, this is a lot of words, I'm sorry, but we're doing this for 34 different proteins, 100 plex, and we're going to do a blinded verification study, which is going to assess the accuracy, precision, reproducibility for measurements of unknowns across multiple laboratories and multiple instrument platforms. Uh, and this is just an example of what this data looks like. So this is uh, 334 peptides, 1,000 transitions being monitored in a single run. So it's really quite feasible to do this now on modern mass spec instrumentation. So back to this question of sensitivity. Uh, and this is plasma. This is the famous Lee Anderson slide showing the, the dynamic range of proteins. Every one of these marks is a clinically measured protein. Uh, all the way down to the bottom of the range, which are the interleukins. So this is the 10 to the 11th order of magnitude uh, range, where microgram per mil is kind of about here, uh, with where things like CRP lurk, and then here are here's a nanogram per mil where you have when in the course of when you have disease PSA and CEA and the the troponins get elevated into into this range. So there are actually a lot of proteins that are well within this one microgram per mil range where mass spectro this MRM technology in its current form could be deployed if you cared to do it and achieve these highly multiplexed measurements. But the reality is, is that most credentialed biomarkers exist kind of in this nanogram per mil range and lower. And we need to figure out ways of achieving, uh, of getting us into, into this range. Um, and as I set up on the slide title here, we view this as plasma is kind of the New York City of matrices. If you can measure it there, you can measure it anywhere. The, uh, 
The way we do this is by, again, a simplified processing approach that initially depletes of abundant proteins, then enriches for peptides with a fractionation that produces six to eight fractions. And the way you do this doesn't really matter. It could be strong cation exchange. It could be uh, reverse phase chromatography. That doesn't really matter. Uh, you then uh, interrogate each one of these fractions for your, uh, your N peptides. Could be up to 100 per fraction. And we published this work back in 2007 and demonstrated that using this simplified processing, we could push the sensitivity from a microgram per mil down to the bottom of the nanogram per mil range effectively for any protein of interest. So this is a, uh, a general approach for measuring proteins in the context of plasma or any other biological matrix you'd like to look in. I'll just illustrate this very quickly in the context of this model that I mentioned, which is the planned myocardial infarction model. Just briefly about this, it is a therapeutic procedure in which a catheter is inserted in a patient who has uh, uh, congestive, really uh, congestion of the uh, of the of the uh, of the ventricles, blood flow is restricted through the heart. Uh, we inject, we being the the clinicians at Mass General Hospital, insert the catheter and inject alcohol into the uh, enlarged region of the heart. This effectively kills the tissue in that region, relaxing it and allowing uh, blood flow to be restored. Uh, while this process is going on we can sample using a second catheter in the coronary sinus, which is the, think about it as the drainage canal for the myocardium. We can sample the blood in that, myo, in that uh, coronary sinus pre-ablation, pre-injection of the alcohol, and 10 minutes and then 60 minutes post-injection of the alcohol. And we then continue to sample in the periphery of the patient. But the IRB requires us to remove the catheter uh, the sampling catheters at uh, the one hour time point. So we did our discovery in this, and I mentioned that's where we got the, the 1,200 protein list with 122 differentially abundant proteins. Um, and then we're gonna move to the semi-quantitative verification stage, which is the accurate inclusion mass screening, where the sample now is not the coronary sinus blood, but the peripheral plasma of other cases. Uh, and then we're going to move into a quantitative verification stage that I'll illustrate where we're going to be using those assays to monitor peripheral plasma of both uh, planned myocardial infarction as well as spontaneous MI patients uh, and controls who are undergoing routine catheterization. So here's the, here's the top end of the list of 50 to 55 uh, qualified peptides by Ames. Um, there were antibodies available for the list of 55, only for, uh, I should say, six out of the 55. Uh, we chose four of these candidates that had interesting uh, temporal profiles in terms of their change in abundance. In other words, they went up early and they tended to stay up, which are the things that we would like to monitor from a biomarker standpoint, and we decided to make assays for those. But we also were assaying for other proteins that were in our discovery list, uh, that were well-known, well-established markers of cardiovascular disease. And I should say, this is one of the great things about trying to do biomarker discovery in cardiovascular disease. At least there's some things that you'd better find if you're working in uh, myocardial infarct. So the things like the troponins, of course, nonspecific markers like CRP, uh, which go up in virtually any disease, that ought to be there. But more specific things like myeloperoxidase, new markers such as MRP14 and interleukin-33, and these novel candidates that were, came out of our discovery effort. So we used multiple peptides per protein because we, again, this is sort of a confidence building. We're not just using a single peptide per protein, but multiple peptides, and constructed this 42-plex assay. This is data for, which has been published already, for two abundant protein markers in these patients. This is just a subset now of the about 10 or more uh, patients that we've done this in. So this is CRP and MPO showing uh, the red and the green, sorry, the, yeah, the sort of the pink and the green represent biological replicate analyses, so complete process replicates going back to the patient sample, showing the reproducibility of the MRM. And the green is the ELISA. So we happen to have ELISAs available for all four of these proteins. And so I'm showing you the correspondence of the MRM data to the ELISA. And you'll notice that there's not 100% correspondence. 
nor would we expect there to be. What's important is that the temporal trends are entirely consistent with the ELISA, and our interassay CVs are respectably below 25%. These are the, and I don't mean for you to be able to see this very well, but you can see that there are, these are basically six different patients out of the, uh, the 10 we've done so far, tracking these four novel candidates uh, and showing the temporal trends for them at four different time points from pre-injection, uh, 10 minutes, 60 minutes, and 24 hours, all measured in the peripheral blood of, of these uh, PMI patient samples. So you can see that there's very good trend. You know, obviously some patients respond differently than others. Uh, uh, there are con some considerable differences. For example, this patient versus this patient. That's not to be unexpected. This is just inter-individual variability. Uh, all of these uh, proteins were down at the bottom of the nanogram per mil range. And again, the CVs for these measurements were reasonably tight, under 20%. Now, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to move to a uh, the, really the next stage of this technology. So I have focused on the fact that we're not using protein-directed antibodies to do an initial enrichment step. Instead, we're using physiochemical separation methods to get us to an initial uh, you know, decomplex sample that we can make our measurements in. Now I'm going to tell you about the use of antibodies, but these are antibodies directed against the peptide and meant to immunoprecipitate the peptide. We are not making antibodies to, against the peptide and then trying to pull out the protein, which is the more common thing that, that is done. Now let me tell you how this works, and I'll tell you why we want to go this way. So here is our peptide, peptides in a digested plasma sample, for example. We, as we've done before, we add our heavy labeled internal standard signature peptide. Now, instead of doing a fractionation, we directly capture out of this digest with uh, anti-peptide antibodies on magnetic beads. And so we are simultaneously capturing the carbon-12 version of the peptide from the analyte of interest, as well as the spiked-in heavy internal standard for that peptide. And we go through effectively the same um, experiment where now we wash to get rid of non-physiologically bound peptides, elute, and go directly into the mass spectrometer. So you can see that this re eliminates the need for the depletion and the fractionation steps, which is uh, uh, quite a bit of labor uh, and time savings. And we end up with effectively the same result. Uh, so the advantages here are this is much simpler sample handling than what I just showed you. And yet, using this approach, we directly reach these same sensitivity limits of around a nanogram per mil, starting with roughly uh, 10 to 30 microliters of patient plasma. Importantly, this requires only a single antibody. Because the mass spectrometer effectively is the secondary antibody here. It is what's giving us the specificity that we would use a secondary antibody for, as well as the measurement. So what are the things that give us that specificity? First, it's the mass of the peptide, as measured by the instrument, the fragmentation of that peptide, the relative ratios of the fragments to one another, and the retention time in the chromatographic system. So there's multiple bits of evidence that say this is with very high specificity what you think you're measuring is what you're measuring. And then we can do the ratioing. And importantly, creating an anti-peptide antibody that actually can pull out the peptide of interest turns out to be a relatively straightforward process. And I'll come back to this in a, in a few slides. This is much more amenable to automation than the procedure I showed you on the previous slide. So we have actually already semi-automated this using a Kingfisher magnetic bead handling robot. We're now moving to other liquid handling uh, systems uh, to make this as robust and automated as possible. And of course, by doing this, this will also increase our measurement CVs. Uh, going back to this uh, system, our, our planned myocardial infarction model, we created cis-kappa assays directed against peptides coming from cardiac troponin I, a well-known marker of, cardio, cardiac, uh, of myocardial infarction and cardiovascular disease, and a novel marker uh, still being credentialed interleukin-33. And in both cases, we're able to get, this is in, the, in plasma, able to hit sub-nanogram per mil uh, limits of detection and quantification. And this is the use of the cardiac troponin I uh, measurements in patient samples just for 
five different PMI patients, just showing that we've moved, it, moved this into actual uh, assay uh, use. An important point about the Cis-Kappa assays relative to conventional sandwich amino assays is that they are not subject to the same interferences, of which there are many, uh, that plague conventional uh, uh, immunological assays, these anti-idiotypic responses. And in large part, this is because these antibodies are digested when we digest the plasma. So they're not present when we're making the measurement. Uh, and I should point out that this is, if you're interested in this further, I would direct you to this article by Hufnagel and Winner in Journal of Immunological Methods that discusses this in more detail. Now, I've talked about hitting nanogram per mil levels using 10 to 30 microliters of plasma. More recently, we've pushed this to say, well, what happens if we, and so here's an example. This is a nine-plex assay against nine cancer-relevant targets. Sorry, you can't read that, and I can't read it, but it's it's not really that important. The point is that in the context of plasma, you can hit roughly an anagram per mil for every one of these targets. This is a nine-plex capture and with good CVs. If you now, uh, as a proof of principle, digest a mil of patient plasma, use up the amount of antibodies for capture, you can hit 10 picogram per mil detection limits for these same nine proteins. Um, I, I would, for those of you who are not in this area, there's really relatively few uh, qualified immunoassays available that hit that kind of sensitivity limit. It's generally more in the 50 to 100 picogram per mil range is where one finds this. So this is a drafting tool that can, think about this as a drafting tool for assays that can give us this kind of sensitivity if we need it. Of course, digesting a milloplasma is not all that straightforward and is a complication for this. But even with 100 microliters of plasma, that pushes us well into the, into the picogram range. Uh, we have begun to assess the intra and interlaboratory reproducibility of these assays, and it's really quite good. Uh, I won't dwell on this, but it's kind of in the range of 7 to 15 percent. Uh, there's a paper that's working its way through the review process from my lab and uh, Mandy Palovich's lab, who is my uh, partner in all of these act, uh, CISCAPA related activities uh, it's really looking at, uh, at a group at the University of Victoria that's looking at the reproducibility of these assays. Uh, we are well into the, uh, the process of, of creating and qualifying. Now it's, this number is no longer correct. It's up to 250 CISCAPA assays. So this is against roughly about 110 different proteins, so multiple CISCAPA assays per protein target. And this uh, just shows you that we have uh, evaluated these 216, in this case, assays in a very rough four-point curve just to get its capture efficiency. So this is how we evaluate each of these antibodies and, and sort of grade them. And import, the important point is that 95% of the proteins have at least one working assay out of these 100-plus protein targets. And 75% of the peptides in fact, perform in the Cis-Kappa capture. And for roughly that number, we have two or more assays per protein. Uh, these assays, I've shown you only nine plex. Uh, more recently, we've pushed the plex level up to 50 plex. So this is showing you uh, panels of those 216 assays configured as groups of 10, 20, 30, up to 50. And this is for one of the analyte peptides in each of those contexts, and you'll see that the performance really doesn't change very much. It's, it's nearly independent of the plex that it happens to be in. Uh, there are some bad actors, so there are some sources of interference, but this represents fewer than 15% of the assays show this kind of behavior where when we start to go up to very high plex levels, we begin to see um, uh, interference creeping in. So. Um, I just want to point out that we're, we, we, rough, we have approximately uh, 230 of these anti-peptide antibodies uh, uh, made. Another 150 will be evaluated before uh, the end of this year. We have a large number of fraction MRM assays in progress. Um, so there's a lot of work uh, in this area, and we're moving rapidly into uh, patient sample analysis. I mentioned briefly the potential for clinical utilization of this. 
And I just want to point out that the first prototype clinical Ciscapa assay has already been generated, and again by our colleague Andy Hufnagel at the University of Washington. This is the reference, and if you can't write it down or are interested, you can just email me. Uh, but the point is, is that thyroglobulin is a clinically measured uh, cancer-related protein for thyroid cancer that has lots of interferences. And this is kappa assay largely gets around those interferences and gives performance that is nearly as good as the current clinical assay. Um, now, I've talked about all the positive features of this. I haven't shown you a single mass spectrum this entire time, but I couldn't resist at least showing you some data. Uh, and I want, but this is to make a point, and that is that you can't just jump to this technology and assume that everything is going to work. And part of it is, is that the software isn't there yet to actually help the analyst figure out whether they've got an assay that is or is not detecting the right thing. And this has to do with the fact that there are colluding interferences that will screw up your, the accuracy uh, of, your, of your quantification if you don't recognize them. So here's a well-behaving peptide where what I want you to pay attention to is the correspondence of the red and the blue lines here in terms of their relative ratios for various spike levels. And you'll notice that these are all pretty good. That's the ratio of the heavy to the light analyte. So we want to see that. We want to see the fragment ions from the peptide having the same ratios as the added internal analyte. Now here's a case where the analyte peptide, and here's its heavy isotope, Look at the ratios. So here's the heavy isotope. It should, the blue should have the same ratios, relative ratios, as the red, and it does not. So if you're paying attention, you'd say, aha, this isn't the peptide, or it has a tremendous interference present, and I need to do other things. So we have written a program called Audit, uh, which allows us to go from having to analyze all of the data uh, by experts to a automated system that tells us when there's an interference problem. And I can't go into details of this, but it's an open access software which looks at the relative ratios of these peaks, but also looks at the, um, uh, the, the, the CVs of the, of the analytes to give uh, the analyst insight into which transitions, which peptides have bad performance and which ones are perfectly okay. You don't have to look at the data. On, I'm, I'm about to wrap up here in a two, two minutes. I, I want to tell you some things that are on the near horizon. So on the near horizon, routine 100-plex assays using this fraction MRM-based approach and for proteins in any matrix of interest, be it blood tissue, cells. Uh, we're going to get to improve sensitivity and throughput through automation of this anti-peptide antibody approach, routine 30-plex kappa. Importantly, if we want to move this into the clinic, can we speed up the inject-to-inject -inject cycle, the analysis time? And the answer to that in preliminary data is yes. We think we can get to five to 10 minute analysis times in 50 plex, which would mean 1,000 proteins per day. This begins to look like potentially useful from a clinical standpoint. Um, and equally importantly, the sensitivity of mass spectrometer instruments and more, perhaps equally importantly, the specificity of these machines is increasing all the time and is going to translate directly into improvements in our limits of detection and quantification. And uh, we have begun to explore with the FDA through a Mach 510K process uh, what the issues are that FDA will be looking at if and when these assays move forward. Now, I should say this is not the primary focus of my laboratory right now. We're really focused on this verification piece, but there's no reason not to consider the bright future of what about using this in a clinical setting. I think today the answer is use verification to whittle down to a relatively small number of highly credentialed candidates and move them forward onto existing clinically deployed analyzers using monoclonal antibodies because there's a deploy base of 100,000 instruments out there, and it's going to be hard to change the clinical environment anytime soon. Uh, but I think this is something which uh, we should pay attention to for the future. I focused almost entirely on unmodified versions of the protein. But I want to, uh, it, it should go without saying that one can use this to monitor for any version of the protein you might want to go after. 
So there's uh, a couple of papers already beginning to look at this, particularly from an analysis of post-translational modification and a uh, mutation standpoint. Uh, some work from John Kuhlman, who's uh, down in Florida, and a recent paper from the Vogelstein lab, uh, which has used MRM, SRM technology to look at either PTMs, which phosphopeptides specifically, or uh, unique variants of uh, proteins in the context of cancer. Uh, and of course, if this worked, you would have a pathogenomic protein, something that detection alone, because it's unique, could be diagnostic. And you could use it for any PTM of, of interest. So I think this technology is really discovery-based large-scale OMIS experiments aren't going to go away. But I think that these methodologies that I've focused on are going to have a transformative effect on proteomics and move it into a much more precise, quantitative, and comprehensive science. This requires us to have basically databases uh, of proteins, the best peptides from them, and experimentally derived properties. This is already happening through efforts at ISB, at the Broad Institute, and other locations. Repo uh, re uh, repositories of reagents. This is also happening uh, slowly through really funded efforts through NCI, uh, NHLBI, and uh, various foundations, and, ass and assay development and application laboratories. And I would say that this really begins to look like the ingredients of a human protein detection and quantification project. I'll finish with this slide, which is much more of a plea than anything else, and that all of the work that we're doing uh, will mean nothing if we don't start with good biospecimens. And there's really an urgent need for large collections of high quality case and control samples that are accessible for these discovery experiments. These collections do exist, but they're very restrictive in terms of access to them. And, and uh, uh, for discovery purposes, we need uh, generally more material than they're willing to give. Uh, I think the time is now to, to consider how we build this up. Discovery and verification programs have been hampered by this. Uh, I say repositories do exist, uh, but some of them are really quite bad. Controls drawn from different populations, they've been handled different, and this has introduced bias. This is one of the big plagues of uh, the biomarker proteomics area, which we now know how to deal with, but requires us to address this problem of the lack of biospecimens. And study by study prospective collection is fundamentally what we're forced to do right now, but it's very inefficient. Uh, and it causes us to rebuild these, these clinical uh, collections, which I think is really unnecessary. So we need to have some uh, uh, attention paid to this. So I hope what I've shown you is that uh, uh, traditional detection quantification methods are still of tremendous value, but they have limitations, not only in numbers, but in term and, and content, but in terms of their ability to be multiplexed. That these new targeted MS-based approaches uh, do have sufficient specificity, sensitivity, and are sufficiently quantitative to make measurements in any biological context of interest. And that if we integrate these modern proteomic technologies, uh, you can move from discovery paradigms systematically to well-credentialed markers that are worthwhile studying in uh, larger numbers of patient samples for true clinical validation. And this is a large group of people who are responsible for this work. Uh, in my lab, um, I'd like to just point out Mike Gillette, who's been, he's a uh, MD, PhD in the lab. It's been instrumental in um, uh, design of experiments, as has Steve Skates at MGH, Hasma Kashishian, who's very central to all of the quantification work, Terry Adana, Sue Batiello as well. Uh, and a variety, number of other folks. My collaborators in the PMI experiments that I talked about uh, are, include Robert Gersten uh, and Mark Sabatine at Brigham and Women's. The cancer-related work and all of the CISCAPA efforts uh, are done collaboratively with Amanda Palovich uh, at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and her group. Lee Anderson has been part of our team, uh, helping to give us advice and guidance on CISCAPA and a group at University of Victoria that's been part of our CPTAC effort. And of course, none of this work wouldn't be possible without the generous funding and support of the National Cancer Institute, NHLBI, and various foundations. Thank you very much for your attention.
I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. So yes, please, if there are questions, there are microphones in the aisle, and since we're video casting, it's good to go there so we can hear the question. Please uh, give your name and uh, go ahead. Yes. Congratulations for an excellent work. Uh, so in terms of diagnosis of myocardial infarct, using the invasive procedure versus the conventional approach, what are the advantages you have? And uh, do you have another protein or biomarker you could use, equally sensitive or better? Um, so I'm, I'm having a little trouble understanding the question. Uh, could you repeat, just repeat it, please? Oh, I mean, I am trying to ask a question regarding the sensitivity of your approach okay. using invasive versus conventional. And do you have another protein biomarker yes. that could be more sensitive than uh, CPKMB or trop troponin T, as you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, again, this is, we're not far enough along to say we have a biomarker that is more sensitive and specific than either of those other markers. Not yet. This is, you know, again, a, the biomarker pathway begins with developing that highly credentialed set of potential of candidate markers then putting them together in panels and then measuring them uh, in patient samples and looking at the receiver operator curve performance in terms of sensitivity and specificity for the, uh, you know, for the panel, for the individual markers as well as for the panel. Uh, we are moving in that direction. That is a major focus of our cardiovascular proteomics center, which was just recently funded. Um, and we're just in the first few months of that of that program. So today, no, we don't. Do we have hope that we will get there? Yes, but I think you have to view biomarker discovery in the same light as one views drug discovery. You start off with reasonable hypotheses and good targets. You march down the path of building additional information and about the specificity and the biological impact of that particular drug. And then you go into human patients in large numbers. And that's where things can fall apart. And uh, you know, the timelines for this can be quite lengthy. And I think that we should put biomarker discovery in the same context. It's gonna take the same sort of timelines. And I think the failure rate or the attrition rate of candidates in this process is probably going to be very similar. Thank you. Yes. Nice, uh, interesting, provocative talk, Steve. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about the, a little bit about the implementation and suggested that in some cases it may be good to go to purely uh, antibody-based uh, assays at the endpoint. Yes. I'm wondering about the Syscapa antibodies that yes. you described that you developed specifically yeah. for the mass spec-based assays. Do these uh, peptide-directed antibodies work for holoproteins and can they in general be used to develop uh, uh, non-mass spec uh, based assays. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is a this is a terrific question, Mark. Um, so, I will point out. I should start by pointing out that the criteria for peptide selection has nothing to do with calculated immunogenic properties of the peptide. So that's the starting point. So we sort of have, you know, biased against that possibility potentially. Our criteria for selection have everything to do with the. Um, the response of that peptide and its fragmentation behavior. We want peptides that give the strongest electrospray response possible. So that's the starting criteria for this. Um, it is quite conceivable that some number of these peptides will be surface exposed, have the right properties, and therefore be suitable, the antibodies to them, be suitable for capture of either the native or the unfolded protein. We don't, the, the small number of cases where we've tested this it's not looking very good. But Mandy Palovich, I think, is in process of doing this in a larger number, taking those antibodies and probing a much larger number of intact proteins to see whether we can IP. But the early data suggests that it's not gonna be a general route. Uh, I should say all of these antibodies are polyclonals, and for you know real ultimate utility, we're gonna have to move these into monos. And the way we do this is by saving the splenocytes from the from the rabbits, and we have made monoclonals out of a subset of the targets in the CPTAC program, a panel of about 12 of these uh, that will be in large enough perpetual quantities for people to be able to use. And of course, one could always move all of them into monoclonals if you wanted to. 
Yes. Uh, Steve, can I add to this the previous question? Uh, in my lab, we did uh, many years ago work uh, analogous to CISCAPA. Okay, it was about the same time we published in 2005. Mm -hmm. We developed polyclonal monospecific antibodies to three human uh, cytochrome P50s, triptych mm -hmm. peptides. Yes. And out of those three, two actually worked for proteins. We used them when we compared on uh, Western bloats. They not only worked for the same capturing peptide and so on, they've worked for the whole proteins too, well, but not all of them, okay? But some, and later when we worked uh, with human samples, it turns out that those peptides were just, well, happily found that they corresponded to the ones that were able to identify on uh, whole proteins. Well, that's, that's fabulous. I mean, that actually is very encouraging. So I do think it's worth the time to actually test which ones work and which ones don't, because a bifunctional reagent that can pull out both protein as well as peptide would be a, a big win. You commented on the fact that it's difficult to use plasma or blood for discovery. Uh, can you comment as your, on urine as a proximal fluid and uh, problems in using urine in discovery as well? I'm a nephrologist, so it's a fluid that's dear to my heart. Yes. Well, I, I actually think Mark Second Nepper, favorite fluid. your colleague Mark Nepper here, who just asked a question, uh, is, is probably a much better expert on urinary proteomics than, than I am. Uh, we are doing urinary proteomics as part of our um, kind of molecular epidemiology infectious disease proteomics project. Um, urine is a good source for markers, but it has a lot of complications relative to uh, plasma or serum. Uh, and one of those is the very high degree of variability in the absolute abundance of proteins in, in, in the fluid and the relatively low overall content of proteins. So there's, a, there's just technical issues from a processing standpoint, um, but it's a perfectly, if you're looking at uh, diseases of the kidney, okay, then I would think urine would be a terrific starting point. Now, Mark and I had a conversation about exosomes uh, this morning. And, you know, I think there's a lot, this is part of the spectrum of methodologies to enrich for proteins of interest. So anything that you can do that would compartmentalize potential markers or enrich for subsets of proteins that you're interested in, be it exomes, be it looking at proximal fluids, those are the strategies that I would, I would deploy. Unfortunately, I think urinary proteome, from the analyses that I've seen in our own work, is essentially as complicated as the plasma proteome, just less concentrated. Thank you. Sure. Um, I have two technical questions about the MRM assays with internal standards. So one is, how do you determine the concentration of your internal standards given the high dynamic range yes. of... Uh, how much to add? This CRP MPO was like yeah. two orders of magnitude higher than yes. troponins. And, and of course, if you spike too much, it will be not good. Right. And the second question is, if you verify the completeness of your triptych digests, because yes. this also will affect yeah. your quantification. Yeah, all of these are, these are very good questions. So we, we begin by doing kind of an initial survey uh, of what the, you know, get some notion of what the range is that we want to be making the measurement in. Is it, you know, hundreds of nanograms per mil, or is it the bottom of the nanogram per mil range? We will then adjust the spike level to be within a factor of 20 to 50 of the concentration we expect to be able to measure. You don't have to be any closer than that, okay. but it's not good to be at concentrations, yeah. you know, differentials larger yeah. than that. It starts, you know, the physics of the instrumentation uh, start to prevent you from making an accurate measurement. Now, so that's one of the questions. The other was the completeness of the digestion. Yeah, because the spiked peptides, they are, oh, I'm they sorry? are the spiked peptides, the yeah. internal standards, they are, um, they are like complete triptychly digested peptides, right? Yeah, so these are complete, yes, so the, uh, I didn't, again, I didn't have time to talk about this. There's a number of ways of, of skinning this particular cat, okay? The problem, as you're alluding to, is that the digestion efficiency, the release efficiency of any given triptych peptide from a protein is going to vary widely, and it does. Okay, even under optimal digestion conditions, we see factor of 10 difference between an optimally released peptide and one that's 
poorly cleaved. And that could be the result of multiple clip sites because there are ragged or multiple uh, basic sites where it's cleaving at both, or it could be it's a protected region of the protein and it's very hard for the trypsin to get at it. So, and this is even under circumstances where we're highly denaturing with urea, for example, or TFE, yeah. whatever mm -hmm. you happen to be using. So, the realize that I, folk, I kept saying precise relative quantification. And what matters here is the reproducibility of the digest. Right. It does not matter so much whether you have 10% release of a peptide or 100% release of the peptide if the digest is reproducible. All right. Okay, and if the, the CVs for these biological process digestion replicates shows that the digests are reasonably reproducible because the the overall CV for the entire process, mm -hmm. including digestion, is less than 25% in the worst case. Now, can we make that better? And the answer is yes. And can we get to accurate quantification, which I've avoided saying in this talk for very specific reasons, because we don't accurately measure the levels. And the answer to that is yes, you can. So one of the ways you can do this, and we're doing it in the context of this CPTAC study, is to use labeled proteins as the standard so that they are being, so this is mm -hmm. with our collaborators at Argonne right. spiking in N5, fully N15 labeled protein. Uh, those are getting digested simultaneously to the analyte protein of interest and therefore you would expect the accuracy to be much greater and the data you know, says that's absolutely true. Now you don't want to have to necessarily make synthetic analogs of every protein of interest. It would, so there are other ways of doing this. Sandy Markey uh, here in the audience has been making uh, uh, concatamers of peptides from these proteins with regions bounded by the natural sequence in the protein. I think this is a very good idea. We are making peptides that have what we call wings. It's the same notion. So we extend the peptides on both ends with uh, anywhere from three to six amino acids with the natural sequence present. So that when these things digest, and the notion here is that how the peptide digests with wings uh, is, or, or how a protein digests once it's denatured, is driven primarily by the primary sequence context and, and because you've eliminated secondary and tertiary structure. This is not entirely true, but it does work very well and it gets you much closer to an accurate measurement. And I would say from a clinical standpoint, if these assays get deployed, that would be one of the ways of approaching developing calibration curves in clinical labs would be using these sorts of internal standards. Okay. Thank you. So a very interesting discussion, and we can continue that in the library uh, over coffee and cookies, but let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.